we should just hang out more often. That'd be great. Right now? <laughs> sure. I mean, jump on stage. <laughs> we got extra mics. Uh, hey, guys, why don't you go ahead and open up your Bibles to Romans chapter 5. So if you don't know where Romans is, if you open up your Bible to the New Testament, about three-fourths of the way through your Bible. It's going to go Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, and then right after Acts is going to be this big 16-chapter book called the Book of Romans, or the Letter of Romans, uh, and that's where we're going to be at today uh, in chapter 5, uh, verses 12 through 17, uh, and so uh, we'll, we'll come back there. And as you're turning over there, uh, let, me just, let me just pray for us real fast. And then, uh, and then we'll jump into our sermon uh, this morning. Father in heaven, we just pray that as we open up your word uh, this, this afternoon, Father, that you, Father, as we, as we kind of walk through um, a bit of a thorny, difficult, uh, sometimes challenging text, uh, Father, would you uh, give our hearts softness to hear what you actually have to say? Father, would you correct things in our hearts that maybe uh, are incorrect or maybe uh, improper beliefs that we have about you? Father, would you change those things so that we might be better reflections of your grace to the world around us? But Father, probably more importantly, that we would be able to worship you with greater clarity and faithfulness as well as to know uh, the greatness of the salvation that we have in Jesus. Father, would you work those things out in our hearts now? Father, we also do pray for our uh, middle school brothers and sisters in Christ, Father, as they are at summer camp right now. Father, in the same way that we had a fantastic time last week, Father, would you uh, be working in their hearts, Father, that even some of them would be convicted over sin as well as led to, uh, Father, uh, placing faith in you for some of them as well as growing and knowing you more. Father, would you do that work? Uh, Father, we, we pray on behalf of them that you would accomplish that in them. We just pray all these things in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. I want you guys to take a moment to consider uh, whether maybe you want to admit it or not. There is, there isn't, there's something that isn't quite right about the world that you and I live in. If you spend any amount of time living in the world, which you all have, congratulations, you qualify for this introduction that I'm about to give. We live in this kind of messed up, odd, weird, broken world. It doesn't take us very, very long to see it. So for example, you might flip open your phone and you open up to Instagram or whatever app you guys use now. I don't know uh, what it is anymore. Um, And and maybe uh, you have a friend um, who's perhaps maybe a little bit more honest or maybe they're like a chronic overshare uh, and they have kind of posted something about something that difficult, that is genuinely difficult that's going on in their life. And you read that post, you see that picture and you're like, man, like I know that person. I know what they're walking through and I know how difficult it is. And it kind of leaves your heart kind of feeling for a moment like, man, like this, this is not the way it should be. Or maybe it's on the other end of that and you see a friend who's got like this perfectly posed, filtered photo uh, on their Instagram. <laughs> you nod your head, you're like, yeah, I got a lot of those. Uh, but you know the actual story behind the photo. You know the things that they don't share that doesn't make it to social media, that, doesn't, that the real concerns, maybe what's going on in their home at life, what's going on between their parents right now, maybe they're in the middle of going through a divorce, or maybe you're at home and like you walk by the living room uh, where your parents are watching TV because I don't think any of you guys actually watch the news, uh, and, you, and you just like see for a moment a glimpse of just like the chaos right now that is going on in the world that is around us. I mean, you're like, Mom, just put gas in my car. I don't care what it costs. Just, <laughs> just do it as she like sells her kidney in order to put gas in your car. Um, like, you, like there's things like that as well as wars in different countries and different countries oppressing other countries and all these different things that are going on in the world around us. And we kind of walk away from that being like, man, like I kind of want to arm's length away from that because I don't want to get too close to it because it's so messed up. There's just something that's not right in the world that is around us. Or maybe... Uh, for you, you, you finally get a moment of silence in your heart and then all these thoughts, these memories, these regrets, this guilt and this shame kind of begins to creep into your heart and into your life. You get a moment of silence and you're like, no, 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 like <laughs> voices go away. Uh, and, you, and you pull up your phone or you pull up Netflix and you keep on watching or you disengage and you go to something else. And, and I think at the same time in all of that, we're left with this feeling, kind of this really bad aftertaste that the world that we're living in, that not everything is the way that it's supposed to be. Something is wrong, something is broken, something is messed up in the world that we live in. 
And whether we know it or not, that experience, that commonly shared human experience, leads us to two critical questions that we're going to try and answer today. And I think we'll answer them quite sufficiently, but really it leads to two answers. And maybe you've asked yourself these, these questions, and maybe you haven't, maybe this is the first time you have. But I think underneath all of that yearning or that maybe dissatisfaction with the world that is around us is two questions. One, why is the world so messed up? And secondly, is there anything that can fix it? Why is the world so messed up? And is there anything that can fix this messed up world? And the reality is the way that we answer those two questions, they're critically, critically important questions that shape your entire understanding of the world that is around you. They, they shape how you interact with your family, with your friends, what you pursue as a career, what you study, how you go about doing everything in your life. You, you might not know it, but the, the, the answer, how you answer those two questions guide and shape and form our understanding of the world that is around us. And so the answers to these questions are at the center not only of what we just believe in general, but also in what we believe about God and what we believe about the Bible. And the scriptures then, they actually offer clear answers to these questions, but also they provide not only clear, they don't only bring clarity to these questions, but they also bring hope. They also bring hope to the middle of this broken and messed up world that we live in. And so maybe what I'm hinting at, and maybe you're about to pick up on, what we're talking about is this reality that we live in a world that is ridden and is broken because of sin. Sin is in the world, and it has broken things, not only in our own hearts and in our own lives, but also in, uh, in, the, in, the, in the lives of the people that are, are around us in this world. And if we don't look and understand what God's Word says about sin and how we're then supposed to think through it and deal with it and navigate through it, our entire experience of the world is going to be very, very different and probably a lot messed up, a lot more messed up than God intends for us, for it to be for us as we walk through this world. And so as we um, have been walking through this series the past couple of weeks called Unorthodox, let me, let me help you to understand like where this idea of sin fits in. Once again, like I said, it, it, it kind of gets to probably one of the center, most important parts of what we believe as Christians. I think we, we've kind of gone in really in, in, a, in an important order. We've looked at God and who God is, his character, his glory, his beauty. We looked at the definition that God gives him of himself, that he is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Then we looked at his word, that everything that God has revealed to us in his word about himself, and then also consequently about everything else, especially sin. Sin is true and trustworthy and is something that we can look to for wisdom. John unpacked last week how the Trinity then helps us to understand how especially we are supposed to navigate through relationships with each other in reflection of the way that God is. And we get to this other kind of really critical foundational piece of, of, of how we're supposed to navigate through our lives. And so in this series on Orthodox, we've been unpacking these, oh, there we go. Next one. We've been unpacking these ideas, this, these simple truths that lead to a different way of life. And here's maybe the thing that kind of helps us maybe for a moment to even take a step back and consider that once again, how we answer those two questions, why is the world messed up? And is there, a, and is there something that can fix it? It shapes and, and the, the way that we obviously want to understand the world, but obviously when we look at the world around us, we see that the world answers those two questions in a very, very specific and explicit way. I'm not going to maybe give away all the answers on that. I want you to think through it. We're going to unpack some of that more here. But, but we're going to see here uh, in, this, uh, in, this, in, in this passage that we're going to unpack uh, how important this idea of understanding what sin is and then also then how we can, once again, navigate through that and find hope on the other side will be. And so, uh, like I said, we're going to be in Romans 5, 12 through 17. We're going to kind of slowly walk through this. There's actually, there's some, uh, I guess, slightly confusing parts in this passage. So there are going to be some moments where I'm going to ask you to put your theologian hat on, which I know some of you guys don't like doing. I'm going to try to walk slowly through that. Um, and then and we'll unpack that all together. Um, and so let's uh, kind of go there. And, and so as you guys are, once again, are there, I want to just offer a definition 
for what we are going to define sin to be. So if you're a note taker, this is the, this is the definition uh, of sin. Sin is an action, a thought, or a heart posture that breaks God's perfect moral law. So sin is an action, a thought, or a heart posture that breaks God's perfect moral law. So here we see that sin is, it's much more than just, oh, well, you know, like I punched my little brother in the arm and now I've got to go apologize to him. It's much more than just an action that we do. Before you punched your brother in the arm, you were in your thoughts and in your heart angry against him. This is a similar situation that Jesus brings up in the Sermon on the Mount, where, he's, where, there, where a lot of the religious leaders in his time, they're like, well, God, we didn't act, I didn't actually commit adultery with her. I just, I just looked at her. And, and he's saying, guys, that, like, it's, it's not just the action that is sinful. It's the thought. It's the intent in your heart that even goes as far to even the heart postures that we have, meaning the leanings, the inclinations that we have that through and through, and even as we'll unpack in these next couple of verses, sin is in us and sin is affecting us. And so in some ways, the sermon's probably not going to be like the most encouraging, especially right off the bat. It's probably going to be a little bit uncomfortable and, and, and a little bit hard to walk, walk through. But if we can get through some of this, I think what we'll find at the end is genuine hope and joy at the end of how we can kind of understand all these things and walk through them together. So let's go to Romans 5 and finally read uh, this passage together. And here's what the first kind of little passage uh, says here, the first couple of verses. And I want you to look and, and look at this one word where uh, Paul brings up this phrase, one man, and we're going to explain some of that a little bit here. So Romans 5, 12 through 14 Paul writes to the church in Rome. He says, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through that one man, so remember that, through one man, and death through sin, so death spread to all men because all sinned. For sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, meaning that it was before the law of the Ten Commandments, but sin is not counted where there is no law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, meaning the covenants of Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam and who was a type of the one, of the, of the one who was to come. So let me just explain and unpack some of this real fast. And then what we'll get to after this is we're going to get to two implications of what this text and and the the couple of verses after this means. So right here, Paul kind of just jumps in like head first into uh, some historical stuff that his readers would understand because he's writing to people who are historically Jewish. And so they would know, and they'd be very, very familiar with the Old Testament, especially the story of Adam and Eve in the garden. Are, Are most of you guys familiar with the story of Adam and Eve in the garden? Yes. Okay. I got a couple of hands. So if you're not here, let me explain it to you. So he's referring all the way back to the, the, the garden, he, all the way to back to Genesis, Genesis chapters one, two, and three, where he's talking about the creation of the world and then how God created Adam and Eve. And specifically, he's referring to Genesis chapter three, verses six and seven, where it talks about how Adam and Eve end up eating of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the one tree that God said, do not eat of this tree. Um, he, they eat of it and they end up sinning against God in the garden. And so when Paul here is referring to that one man, as I've underlined here in this passage a couple of times, he's referring to Adam. He's referring to Adam and he's saying here that Adam had this one man, he sinned. He was, the, he was like the first of all of us. He was the first created human being. And since we all descend from Adam, we have the same sin nature that Adam has in his, that Adam had in his heart. That same sin nature is present in us. And this is, on, once again, put on your theologian hat, this is called theologically the idea of original sin. It means that kind of baked into our humanity and into our humanness is this kind of brokenness that because we descend from Adam and Eve, we in our hearts and in our lives have sin present in us. And so don't take my word for it. Let's look at what God's word has to say. In multiple different passages across God's word, we find that the same idea, the same truth is reiterated. So in Psalm 51, verse five, it says, behold, I was brought brought forth in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. Saying, man, even before I exited the womb, I was a sinner. 
and the inclination to sin was in my heart. That's what I desired. In Isaiah 53, verse 6, it says, all, all we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned, every one of us, to his own way. And the Lord, and this is referring to then a prophecy about Jesus, has laid on him, that is Jesus, the iniquity, once again, the sin of us all. And even then in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 3, it says among, this is a, kind of in the middle of a sentence, so it sounds a bit awkward, but he says, among whom all we once lived, this means we all used to live, if we haven't placed faith in Jesus yes, in the, yet, in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and we're by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Aren't you glad you came to high school service today and you got to be called a child of wrath? Awesome. Um, what the Bible is intending to say here, even though these words are hard to hear, convicting, maybe even some of you are offended right now, the Bible is clearly trying to help us to understand who we are and what is wrong inside of us. That there is sin that is living in us. It's, it's pervasive. When I use the word pervasive, pervasive is a great word because it, mean, it means like something, it's like it gets completely all the way through. Like when you're making bread and you put yeast into the bread to make it grow, you want to get the yeast all in the dough because if you don't, then it's going to be this weird lopsided piece of bread. You want, to, like in some, in some circumstances, you want something to pervasively be a part. Like we want to be pervasively in everything that we do in our lives filled with the love of Jesus. But what it's saying here is that pervasive Basically, through every single aspect of who we are as people, in our hearts, in our minds, in our soul, in our thoughts, in our body, sin has affected us. It's affected us within ourselves, but then it affects us interpersonally. And once again, we look out to the world that is around us, and we see brokenness, and we see strife, and we see people fighting, we see people gnawing at each other's necks, trying to get above and over each other, and it's because of the sin that is in the world and the sin that is in us. So there's this original sin that we get from Adam, but then also you might say, man, well, this isn't fair, like just because he did it, like I didn't even get the chance to mess up, but let's just logically work that back. Okay, so let's, for example, take the Ten Commandments. Ten Commandments says, don't lie, don't steal. And we can all, if you're being honest with yourself, and that's the key, if you're being honest with yourself, know that at some point in your life, you have lied, or you have stolen something, or you've disobeyed your parents. And part of that, even, and many more things that we've done, even one infraction, even one moment of breaking God's perfect moral law is to fail the test completely. There is no, oh, great effort, participation trophy. There's none of that. One moment of messing up God's law, of which we have committed many, means that we've broken all of it entirely and completely. There's, here's a couple of verses that kind of point to that reality. Romans 3, 23 says, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Romans 6, 23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Ephesians 1 and uh, 2, verses 1 through 2, the beginning of this passage that we just read earlier, it says, And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which we once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. And I believe there's one more. Um, there's not. It'll be in there somewhere. Um, and this points out to us that not only is it true that Yes, we descend from Adam, and that same sin nature is in us, but it also proves that you and I, even this morning, have in probably in some way, shape, or form committed sin against God, that we've broken his perfect moral law. And what Paul is pointing out to us in this passage is that because we descend from Adam, this is, this is who we are. This is, the, this is, if we're honest with ourselves, and if we truthfully want to know the truth and we look at God's word, this is the reality that we live in. We live in broken, messed up hearts and bodies, imperfectly trying to walk and navigate through this world. And we live in a world that is broken and ridden by sin in probably more ways than we can count and in many ways that we're not even aware of. 
And as I kind of teased even on the, 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 the screen here, like, why does this matter? Once again, we're getting back to those two questions. Why is the world messed up? And is there anything that we can, is there anything that we can do to fix it? Why does this matter? And it, it matters because, once again, when, when we walk through the world, when we walk through our relationships, if we don't have a concept and an understanding of what sin is and why the world is the way that it is, there's kind of this mental disconnect that happens with what we then think the solution to the things that are wrong in our life are. And it's, and it's honestly, friends, it's, it's supremely dissatisfying to, to kind of walk through life or it would, it would end up being really dissatisfying if you're like, oh, well, I'm just going to kind of stay in my own lane and I'm not really going to care about anyone else. Like, I'm not going to help solve any of the world's problems. Or to think naively that, oh, I'm going to make tons of money. I'm going to become the second Elon Musk. And, and I'm going to, you know, just give money to all these people in the world. And I'm going to solve all the world's problems. Because all of that is like cancer. It's like a Band-Aid on cancer. It doesn't actually get to the heart of the issue. The heart of the issue is that there's something wrong in our hearts. There's something wrong inside of us that needs to change. And so this matters because it matters how then how we are able to walk through life, but then also the kind of hope that we're able to have. So here are some of the implications of this. I think there's, there's two kind of big implications that I want to unpack for us briefly here in the next couple of minute, minutes. Um, it's, well, the first one is this. A biblical understanding of sin identifies what is wrong and what needs to change. I'm not going to belabor the point anymore, but God's word points out what is wrong. The issue is sin. And the issue is that we've committed sin against God. We've missed the mark. Maybe you guys have heard the analogy of the, the archery analogy where the archer is trying to hit the, the target. And, and, it's, and it's not just that like we like just barely missed the bullseye and like, oh, shucks, almost made it, like almost lived the perfect life. It's that like we, we've pulled back with all of our effort and with all of our strength and the bow and the arrow is like shaking in our hands and we lob our attempts at the target of God's perfect moral law to try and hit it. And in a very unsatisfying way, our arrow always drops 10 to 20 feet before the target. Like, we don't even get close. So God, God's word points out what is wrong. It points out why the world is the way that it is. But also then it points out what needs to change. And this is then also very different from the world that we live in. And so what we know about the world that we live in, and this is, once again, not pointing at the world and saying the problem is out there because the problem isn't out there, friends. The problem isn't here. But what we see that the world is messing up around us is that when they see God's perfect moral law, they say, well, that's stupid. And so we're just going to throw it out. And they just yeet the Bible and everything else out of the window saying, I don't want to have anything to do with it because it points out what is true about me and what is real about the world that I live in. And I don't want that. And so since I don't want that, I'm going to throw it out. And I'm just going to construct my own morality. I'm going to construct my own ideas of what is right and what is wrong and what is true and what is good and is beautiful. And so we find in this world that we look in that there is just layers upon layers of confusion and chaos around what is right and what is wrong. And it feels like people are like, well, we don't know what's right and what's wrong. It's like, yeah, we do. Like, like, get out of the matrix for a second. That's like an early 2000s reference. But like, like, like take a step out of like this, this weirdness that we're living in and realize that there are actual ways for us to understand what is wrong and what needs to change. It's not just because we may, might not like what God's word says doesn't mean that it's wrong. What it does mean is that there's something in our hearts that needs to change. And, and that's where, as, as, as passionate as I might get about helping you guys to see that, that hopefully tenderly I can walk us to this place, when, is that when we see that, man, there's something in God's word that's difficult to encounter and to work through, that we should not then reject God's word, but actually we should say, okay, God, we, we come to him in humility and we say, God, there's something wrong in me. I want to be honest about that. God, would you work in me and help me to change so that I may become a lover of your word and a lover of what you've commanded. That's the process of sanctification. It's a process of change that we talk about so often and that we desire and that we get in life groups together to do. Like that's the process that we have to walk through. And so what needs to change is not God's law, but it's our hearts. 
And here's the hope. It's that a biblical understanding of sin, it also, if it identifies what is wrong and what, is, and what needs to change, it also identifies our Savior and how we can find hope in a broken world. It identifies our Savior and how we can find hope in a broken world. So go back to Romans 5 with me, verses 15 through 17. And this is what God's word says about this. He says, but the free gift, he's talking about Jesus, his work on the cross here, but the free gift is not like the trespass saying, what Jesus did is not like what Adam did in the very beginning. He says, for if many died through one man's trespass, okay, so, so hear that language again. He's saying one man. He's referring that, to that same idea. For if many died through that one man's trespass, through what Adam did, much more has the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. And the free gift is not like the result of that one man, of Adam's sin. For the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. And I'll explain some of those words. For if, because of one man, once again, Adam's trespass, death reigned through that one man, through Adam, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus. And what Paul is pointing out here, theologically, like these are some really big ideas that he's unpacking here. So let me try to simplify some of them. What he's saying is that Adam was a type of person and we descend from Adam. We are like Adam. We have the same, the same corruption. The, the, the biggest epidemic in our world is not COVID. It's the fact that there's sin in our hearts. And we have inherited this disease from Adam called sin. And it messes up everything around us. And he's saying that that one man's sin that hurtled all of the world into brokenness, that there was a new man who came. And this man, his name was Jesus. And he came in, in, in a similar, like a same, same, but different uh, kind of way. And he also performed a certain act, meaning that he lived a perfect life in action, thought, and heart posture. He perfectly kept God's perfect moral law on our behalf. And then he went to the cross bearing the, the punishment and the shame and the guilt that we had harbored up over all of our lives, past, present, and future, because of sin, he took that on himself on the cross and said to God, God, pour out your punishment against sin on me so that through my one act of righteousness, I might purchase the salvation and the life and the hope of all these people that you have created. We see that Jesus comes in and he reverses the curse of sin. He reverses the, the curse of when we sin, typically condemnation fills our heart, guilt fills our heart. But Jesus comes in and he brings in a new way of life. He brings in a new kind of salvation, a new kind of act that supersedes, it kind of pushes away the old thing that Adam did. And so when we are then born again, like the phrase you've probably heard of many, many times, we are no longer born of Adam. But when we place faith in Jesus and we trust in his righteousness on our behalf, we're born of Jesus. We're born again in Christ. We no longer inherit the sinful inclination and the, and the sinful heart posture of Adam. But when we place faith in Jesus, we receive a new heart that beats and, 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 and pumps for God's glory and for his joy and for his beauty. And so here's what maybe this practically means for us, and we'll, we'll kind of wrap this up here uh, briefly. Here's what this means. It, w once we are able to kind of wrap our minds around this idea that, one, the, the problem is sin. And that what needs to change is our hearts. And that God sent his son, Jesus. He emptied heaven, as Chris said, of, of God's most precious possession to save us from our sins so that we can now have new life in him. What this practically means for us is that you and I no longer have to live in denial about what is actually going on in our hearts. 
And so this is as much as it is a practical application, it is also a challenge. That to confront these realities is to say, okay, I have to, you have to make a decision today. Whether you're going to raise or and to make a decision or not, is, it's not really up to me. But you have to make a decision when you walk out of this room today. Either I'm going to confront the reality that I have sin in my life, and that's a big issue to God, but that God has provided someone to save me from that, his name being Jesus. And when I place faith in him, I find freedom, I find hope, I find new life and a new heart. That's part of the response of saying, okay, I'm not going to live in denial anymore. And what we find in that when we say, I'm not going to live in denial anymore about who I am and the issue here, we find a verse like this, a couple of verses before the passage that we impact, Romans 5, verse 8, where it says, but God shows his love for us and that while we are still sinners, Christ died for us. And so I hope that that verse would even stand as open and welcoming arms for us maybe who are scared to admit who we truly are inside. And, and scared potentially to, and fearful of potentially saying, man, I am a sinner and that's going to cost me something to say that. And, you would, and that you would see that even, even while you were still sinners, while we were all still sinners, 2,000 years ago, Jesus made a decision to go to the cross to die on our behalf. And he's welcoming us into that. This also means that, one, we, we own what is ours, meaning that, and, and so... Uh, you can go to Psalm 51, 1 through 5. We're not, I'm not, I don't have time right now to unpack all of it. But similar to what Chris said this past week at summer camp, we have to own what is ours. And, and, and sin, it, it, sin is no one else's. My sin is no one else's fault. Even if I've walked through difficult suffering in my life and I've sensibly responded in that, like that's not someone else's fault. That's my fault. And so that means that in humility, we come to God and we own 100% of what is ours. 100% of our sin. 100% of our failings and our mess ups. We own that before God. And once again, what we find in that, we might think, man, if I'm honest, God's going to just like, kick me away. But what we find, once again, is the God who enters in. The God who gets into the messiness with us. When we place faith in him, he doesn't run away from us. When we place faith in him, he sends his spirit to live inside of us so that he can work in our hearts. And so just as, like I said in this passage in Romans 5, I think verse 16 or 17, where once sin and trespass abounded, now through faith in Christ, grace abounds more and more. And when we come and we own our sin before Jesus, we find genuine grace and mercy in Christ. And lastly, we find freedom. We have freedom through faith. We might think that admitting that we are sinners is going to entrap us, but admitting that we're sinners actually leads to genuine and true freedom in Jesus. And this is where we're going to pick up next week. In Romans 5, verse 1, one of my favorite passages in the entire Bible, it says, Therefore, since we've been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That when we admit that we're sinners and we place faith in Jesus and what he has done, we find freedom. Read what those words say. Therefore, since we've been justified by faith, it doesn't say justified by your good attempts, justified by your good effort, justified by kind of scrounging up all of my good acts and trying to give that to God or you know, justified by fooling my parents into thinking I'm a believer or fooling my life group leader into having all the right answers. No, it says we've been justified by faith. It's that simple in a way that if you sit there and you say, man, I'm broken, I'm a sinner and I need help. Jesus, you're the one who can help me. Please save me from my sin. That sounds a lot like faith. And God can then work in us. As we've been justified by faith, then the promise is you now have peace with God. Peace. Genuine, actual peace with God in heaven. That once again, all of the sin and the condemnation and the guilt that we had harbored up over the course of our entire lives through Jesus, gone. We now have peace with God through what Jesus has done for us. 
And so I hope that you guys can see today, even through God's word, when we biblically understand what sin is, it points out what is wrong, points out what needs to change, it points out our Savior, who is Jesus, and that even though we live in a world that's filled with sin and hearts that are broken because of sin, we can still find hope, we can still find new life, and especially we can find peace with God. Let me pray for us real fast and we can head out. Father in heaven, I give you thanks for this time to open up your word. And Father, I genuinely pray that you would break our hearts over the sin that is in us. Father, would you break our hearts over the sin that is in the world around us? And would you send us, Father, as messengers, as bearers of your grace into the world that is around us, Father, that we might be people who bring the message of grace that men's brokenness Father, that you might be glorified and honored uh, in and through us. Father, we pray all these things in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. All right. Uh, If you want to read some Bible passages on this, that's on the screen. Aside from that, you guys are dismissed. Thank you, guys. We won't see you next Wednesday. See you next Sunday.